Writers, you're listening to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast, where we bring you insights and inspiration for growing your self-publishing business, coming to you from Kobo's headquarters in Toronto. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Kobo Writing Life Podcast. I'm Stephanie, and in today's episode, Chrissy and I sit down with USA Today and New York Times bestselling author Penny Reed. Some of her popular series you might know are the Winston Brothers and Knitting in the City. But we talked to Penny about the responsibilities authors have towards their readers in terms of their work. We also learned a bit more about how she got into self-publishing. And we also dip into some controversial romance topics that have been in the headlines recently, such as Copy Paste Chris, Rita So White, and Cocky Gate. It was a really fun and informative episode. So if it's of interest to you, please keep listening. Welcome to the Cobra Writing Life podcast, Penny. We are so lucky and thrilled to have you. Well, thank you so much for having me. And right before we started recording, you and I were talking about how it had been many years that we have been working together, but also since we've seen each other, and obviously longer still since you've been in this indie publishing game. So why don't you kind of walk our listeners through how you got to where you are today as a USA Today <laughs> bestselling author. <laughs> oh, sure. I'll do like one of those, uh, you know, where they summarize Shakespeare, all of Shakespeare's plays in five minutes or less, but Perfect. I'll try to keep it to one minute or less. So I, I used to, in my previous life, I worked at a pediatric epidemiology center in type 1 diabetes and rare diseases research, pediatric rare disease research. And I was the chief operating officer for this very large data coordinating center. And one of my colleagues, read almost exclusively romance and she indicated to me that she was having some trouble finding this was back in like 2011 2012 having difficulty finding books about uh, women who were similar to her which basically meant book brilliant but maybe socially clueless (laughs) so in her particular case I don't think she'd uh, argue that point because we're both somewhat that way (laughs) and so I, I have always written books. And I I should say, actually, I don't know that I'm book brilliant. She was book brilliant. Anyway, so I've always written stories. And I thought people became authors, like people became mermaids or princesses, (laughs) or, you know, that it was a mystical thing. But I'd always written stories. I have, I must have like 10 various stages of being finished that I just was always working on. And so I told her I would write her a romance novel about somebody like her. So I wrote it. She took me out to dinner because I won the bet because she liked it. I had the steak and the lobster and I ordered two bottles of wine. I made her pay for it. (laughs) I saved the book on my computer and went about my day because it was written for a bet. And then a couple months later, she asked me if I could um, upload it onto the interwebs to retailers to have her book club be able to download it because she had told them about it and she wanted them to read it. So I did. I uploaded it and then I forgot about it again. And then when I went back to check a couple of days later, it had been downloaded 8,000 times. What? <laughs> well, I mean, that was crazy. That was 2013. So... Like any sane person, I took it down and I was like, how dare these people read my book? They were leaving reviews and I was horrified because it wasn't for them. And then my husband was like, why don't you get it edited? Because it wasn't even edited. Wow. Anybody. And so I did, I got it edited and we put it back up. And he also suggested, hadn't occurred to me, but to query agents and publishers. And so I did. And it was rejected over a hundred times. I received over a hundred projections for it which I'm kind of proud of now. Yeah. Anyway, that was much longer than a minute. But then I just continued to write books as a hobby for fun and put them up on um, Kobo and all around to all the retailers and figuring this would just be like a fun side thing because I was writing books anyway. And then about a year later, we had to have the hard talk, which was my publishing in- income was <laughs> like three times my income as a chief operating officer for the epidemiology center and I was working like 50, 60 hours because as one does, and I enjoyed the job that I did and the people I worked with and the work that I did. So we just decided made more sense for the family, for our family, because we now have three children for me to write full time. But I did consultant work for my old job for a number of years and I still keep in contact with them. I think part of me thinks I'm still going to go back and work there again. (laughs) 
Which right would now. be fine. I, I love working there. So anyway. So interesting. I really had no idea that that was your backstory. And I'm so glad that I, I know it now. I, I feel <laughs> there might be listeners out there who hate you a little bit. <laughs> that <laughs> It sounds like you lucked into it. Although oh, I am yeah. sure that's not totally the case though, because you had the COO experience that, that gave you a, a leg up on the business side. And based on your books, you have a natural gift for storytelling that I'm sure you've worked at as well over the years. What do you think helped you get that, that initial boost out the gate um, other than, you know, one book club that was keen to read your first book? So what gave me a leg right out the gate? I have to say that there was definitely 100% there was luck involved because, well, for obvious reasons. I mean, that kind of uploading a book everywhere, walking away, and then stumbling across 8,000 downloads. And I, I need to clarify, it was free. It, it was a free book. It was right. 1,000 free downloads because I wasn't going to make people pay for this unedited book. That would be ridiculous. These book club um, members of my friends. In retrospect, I think what it was was the reason why the publishers rejected it, why the publishers and the agents rejected it, which is that, and my, what my friend said, which is that there weren't any books similar of a similar feel to them because i i weave in current events things like bitcoins or artificial intelligence or nigerian oil crisis i weave those current events into the book or into whatever book it is characters are typically very book smart and i don't want to say definitively because i wasn't a big reader of romance prior to writing it just because uh, science fiction was science fiction and fantasy and then literary fiction were just what I had naturally gravitated towards. And then once I started writing romance, I started reading it and discovering how amazing and awesome it was. But I don't get the sense that there, even now there's still a lot of STEM heroines and that there's characters who, my characters rarely have misunderstandings, meaning like there's enough keeping people from being brave, taking that leap towards trusting another human being that misunderstandings don't really, I don't think that they need to be a part of a, of a love story. Rejected by publishers and agents because they, in the feedback I got was because these weren't stories that there was a market for, that romance readers weren't going to be interested in these kinds of books or the, this kind of story. And then what ended up happening is that since the publishers had kept, since traditional publishers had kept those stories as gatekeepers from being out there, that there was a, a niche market mm -hmm. for those kinds of stories. And then the word of mouth just took off, meaning that this is the only kind of book of this type. So, or these are the only kinds of books of this particular type. And yeah. so if you want to read it, then here you go. I mean, I used to write like Marvel fanfic. So I think what happened is that it became somewhat of a, a fandom and fandoms are interesting things in that if you, it's like a cult following, I would say that the books are unusual and that's not an assignment of better or worse. Unusual. I mean, there's been plenty of unusual people, like I won't use extreme examples, but <laughs> unusual doesn't necessarily mean good and it doesn't mean bad. It just means it's another qualitative label. It's really just, they were unusual and 2013, with the luck that out there, since they were unusual, word of mouth spread and they were able to hit their audience. Sorry, that was somewhat of a long response to. I love it. Question. <laughs> I feel like in any conversation, but on a podcast especially, I, it's always nice to have somebody who will chat away. <laughs> no one word answers, please. And thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, good to know. So what challenges do you think that new indie authors are facing today? And do you have any advice for them if they're just starting out in 2019? Okay, so obviously, since there's so many, since there's a lot more of us who publishing is viable, and not the second place to first public to traditional publishing, I think that there's been a real shift, especially in my particular genre and a couple of other genres where people see that Self-publishing isn't like this, the ugly stepsister to traditional publishing, but it might actually be preferred in mm -hmm. a lot of cases, depending on what the content is. There's a lot more of us. I also think that if you don't have the business sense, if you don't treat publishing, being an independent publisher or being an indie author means that you are your own publisher. So if you lack 
the business sense associated with budgets and spreadsheets and tracking data and collecting information and creating business plans, then I do feel that being a independent writer and therefore independent publisher is an uphill battle. Yeah. And then it does make more sense to go with a traditional publisher because they'll handle all the business, the business side of it. But if you love the business side, if you love creating budgets and tracking data and learning about best practices and sharing best practices, and then I think that independent publishing makes a lot of sense. I think that's a great answer. And you're totally right. Like, I don't think there are many people lucking into even on free 8,000 downloads these days because there are just so many people putting marketing dollars towards that free title, you know, as the final for the rest of their content. So you absolutely have to enter it with a business framework in mind and you'll get out of it what you put into it in that regard. Yes, absolutely. And also go where a question I get asked often by new authors is, is my book any good? Can you read me? Can you read my book and tell me if it's any good? And I hesitate. I, I never actually do that because Art is so subjective, and I'm a numbers person. I mean, my background is biostatistics. So you're never going to find a piece of art, whether it be a painting or a sculpture or a book, that's universally loved. Mm -hmm. So if you love your book, if you love it, then I guarantee you there's going to be other people out there who love it. Now, if you want to make a living as an author, then you might have to sand down some of your edges your quirks, as it were. And there's always room for improvement and craft. And so just keeping that in mind, but in terms of is the story any good, it, that's not really the right question. The right question is, how do I reach my readers? That's something completely different. And I think how I reach my readers is by being authentic. Yeah, that's definitely something that we wanted to get into because I feel like that does make you unique in a couple ways like I've read a bunch of your books and you still stay true to that that first book that you were talking about where you bring in all of this in a wide range of references and quotes to Shakespeare and all kinds of interesting yeah. you know old books you're not it's not like this self-referential contemporary romance canon that you're playing yeah. with and no. then <laughs> no, no no I I just find it so interesting you're almost like the romance writer for non-romance readers in a way. That, that's how I identify with you as I would not identify myself as a romance reader, but I read your books. Well, I have tons of um, recommendations for authors who are authentically romantic and aren't thinking about uh, romance in maybe a more typical way where, where, and I, I say typical, but it's really a stereotype. And mm-hmm. it's a harmful stereotype around romance that I don't feel applies anymore because traditional publishers aren't the gatekeepers. So traditional publishers, for better or for worse, are really interested in making money because they have a business and they need to survive. And so taking chances on something new and novel is it's a risk. It's a big risk that maybe they can't justify for their bottom line. And so I have recommendations for a lot of authors who are independent authors who do not write within a box that they very much, or have now that they've shown that they have an audience and that they can do well, they've moved on to traditional, or not moved on, but they've moved into traditional publishing as well. And so they're hybrid. But I think those constraints that made romance such a thing that New York publishing or like let's say the New York Times book review there was that article that Robert Gottlieb wrote that was really just out of touch it was an out of touch picture of the romance genre and I wasn't angry about it because that is how traditional publishers have looked at romance as a way to maybe make a lot of money, but make sure that everybody stays in their lane and stays in their box. And now with independent publishing, that's not the case. People are firmly moving outside of lanes and boxes and lighting them on fire and taking off their bra. And, you know, like... (laughs) It's become somewhat of a revolutionary genre to write in, which is cool, which I super enjoy. Well, you would love to get your list of recommendations to put in the show notes. Are there any that like immediately popped into your mind that you were like, you should read this? Yes. uh, Kennedy Ryan's series 
um, her hoops series. I think it's called her hoop series. She actually, her long shot is the book that was just nominated for Rita. Mm. And she's a hundred percent independent author and she writes realistic romance and it's her stories are very meaty and soulful and they're um, fantastic. She's amazing. Another author who is writing really outside the box is Mariana Zapata. She writes these stories. They're very literary and her readers call them slow burn romance, but I think it's more like realistic people getting to know each other um, before they rip each other's clothes off. They're, they're thoughtful, they're methodical, and the, the characters themselves are so interesting and people that you want to know and be friends with. And her books, more than any other books, remind me a bit of um, Jane Austen in that she's incredibly witty and you really get the sense, and I would actually add Amy Harmon to this as well, mm. who's another recommendation of mine. You really get the sense in the quiet way that Jane Austen had the true measure of a person and how they interact on a daily basis rather than these some grand epic adventure like Moby Dick or, you know, or whatever it is, these kind of these out there adventures don't really prove the measure of a person, but how they treat people on a daily basis is much more indicative of who they are. And those shifts, meaning there's nothing as mundane and as epically life altering as falling in love. There really isn't. Mm. And so they show that through their stories in a way that's um, really beautiful and outside the box, very much outside the box. So, but I can give you a huge list. I mean, Elijah Cothway, who I write with, she's amazing. She's an Irish author and her books are always, she has a book called Painted Faces about a cross-dresser, which is awesome. Uh, highly recommend 10 out of 10. Dylan Allen, she's another author who, she's pretty new. She's about, I think she's been publishing for only about two years. And her books are really beautiful. And she writes about, there's one book, in, oh shoot, I wish I remember the name of it. So when you think of forbidden romance, right? A lot of people think of things like Stepbrother or, you know, my <laughs> friend's this or that. She actually wrote somewhat of a forbidden romance about an immigrant who, did, who was here illegally, who fell in love with somebody. and so. It brings this element of truth and realness and rawness to the story because at any moment, this person could be deported and never be allowed to come back. And showing a love story from that perspective, which is so relevant to what's going on today, mm -hmm. is uh, it was just a gorgeous story. Now I'm going to kick myself for not remembering the name. Wow. We've got, we've got show notes. We'll follow up with you. Okay. Sounds great. So just uh, switching gears a bit. You talked about like thinking about publishing as a business, but what do you think is one of the smartest moves that you have made as a business owner? And then from that, if you had any regrets once you started. Well, one of the smartest moves I made as a business owner was drawing up a, a marketing plan. And then for every release that we have, we modify the marketing plan based on lessons learned. And we either add or remove things, add things that have worked or remove things that haven't or are no longer uh, working in terms of reaching my, my audience. Um, and I would only staple on to that or add on to that. Treating my current readers with respect and not looking over their heads for new readers. Because I think a lot mm -hmm. of authors make that mistake that they don't stay true to who they are in search of a new readership or a larger readership rather than fostering the relationship with the readers who are currently um, passionate about their books. I think that's awesome advice. And, and then, then, yeah, the flip side. A regret. This is going to sound strange. My second book was called Friends Without Benefits. And it was originally called Medical History of a Mixtape. <laughs> and, and I was taught, and I had this great cover. I thought it was the Medical History of a Mixtape. I had this great cover with a mixtape. But it was my second book. I was publishing what I call by committee, which is where I went to a couple of different people. And I said, this is my cover. This is my title. And I was told, no, you can't do that. You're not going to sell any books. Nobody's going to buy a book called Medical History of a Mixtape. No, it needs to look more romance. You need to put a couple on it. And it needs to be called something else. And so I switched the couple, or I switched the cover and the title to make it more romancy. And I've always regretted it. I've always, and that sounds like such a very specific thing, 
But what it taught me was that the people who wanted to buy my books at the time wanted to buy them because they were different and because they weren't necessarily what was already out there and available. And so that one book and changing it and always regretting it is what's led me to now have like cross stitch book covers. Yeah. Or I'm doing, I'm writing a, I'm doing a rewrite of Jane Austen's novels, but with a gender switch in contemporary. So Elizabeth, <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth Bennett is Eli Bennett and, you know, Darcy is um, Darcy Williams, who's a female and yep. you know, Captain Wentworth is a female astronaut and, you know, Anne Elliott is Andy Elliott and, you know, like that kind of Bring thing. It on. Love it. <laughs> and those, covers, <laughs> those covers are Woodburn and they're puns. The titles are puns. And so it's like, be unapologetically yourself, authentically yourself, because it's true that we're all, you know, maybe we're not all special snowflakes, but I'm definitely a potato chip that looks like Groot. So it's, <laughs> you, know, you have to be, people can sense when you're not authentic and that's fine if you want a wayward, fair weather audience. But if you're looking to build, as an independent author, I think that's actually key. And you're, you're looking to have something that's sustainable, being authentically yourself and not looking necessarily at the market and saying, well, what's hot right now? But rather saying, what is reflective of me and the content of the story and what makes it unique? That's the lesson that I took away. Yeah, I love it. And I just love your titles and your covers are so <laughs> awesome. Like when I saw Dr. Strangebeard, I was like, yes, I have to read this book. Like, what is this even going to be about? <laughs> like, I've never seen this for a romance book before. I need to try this one. Said, I want to do a cross-stitch book cover. And they're like, no, you don't. You definitely don't want to do that. <laughs> And so I ended up doing it myself. I, I've designed every single one of my own no, covers. No, come on. <laughs> yes, because I couldn't find, I couldn't find anybody. I've, I'm going to use the word brave. I couldn't find anyone brave enough to do something that far outside of the box. <laughs> and so, you know, at the time that Truth or Beard came out, which was the first book in the Winston Brothers series. That's great titles also. Yeah. <laughs> So they all have beard in them, right? So grin and bearded, beard science, you know. So I have a really great time. Oh, and so we're doing a spin-off series. Sorry, now I, I have to digress here and feel free to keep this or not. But we're doing a spin-off series about this, the area where this takes place in Green Valley, Tennessee, yes. and, which is where they, these stories take place. And it's going to be the Good Folk series. F-O-L-K, Good Folk series. Yeah. Love and it. each of the titles will have the word folk in them, like, um, hmm, get the folk out of here. Or, <laughs> <laughs> and so we're, we're going to have so much fun. And if you're not having fun with it, in a creative endeavor, yes, there's blood, sweat, and tears. But ultimately, if you're not having fun with it, then what are you really doing? What are you even doing? Yeah. Why so, bother? Yeah. I love it so much. So very much on this same topic or thread of authenticity, you recently shared on your Facebook page an email from a reader who was upset about um, buying books from your series, like it was some kind of manipulation. But that was a really interesting exchange and you were honest and you got a response <laughs> back. Can you talk a little bit about that and how you try to navigate situations like that as an, as an author and with the interweb of fan relationships that is today? <laughs> sure, absolutely. I, I think that my sense is that um, as social media has started to take over more of our daily life, creators are much more accessible or there's this impression that they're much more accessible mm -hmm. than they've ever been in the past. And when somebody is accessible, there's a very real danger of the consumers feeling entitled to knowing everything or being or having the creator justify their decision. So I do get from time to time messages telling me how dare I have done X, Y, and Z, or how disappointed people were that I took a story in a particular direction, or who did I think I was, <laughs> like writing something in particular. And that's the equivalent of letters, like companies receiving letters in the past where consumers had expressed a disappointment. Well, in this particular case, this individual who I didn't read the 
initial email, it was pointed out to me later. I, I don't, I often don't see rudeness where others see rudeness. Uh, if somebody asks me a question, regardless of, I don't pick up on tone, I guess I should say. Um, and I don't read into words um, or emails. I assume if somebody's asking me a question, they're honestly asking me a question. Mm-hmm. And the question that she had asked was, um, I have this book series called Laws of Physics. Uh, it's three books. The first two end on a cliffhanger. It's 240,000 words. So it's split into three books because there's three different story arcs. And she, after reading the first book, messaged me upset because she didn't, she felt that me writing two books, splitting it into three was manipulative and that uh, the cliffhangers in books one and two were also manipulating readership and taking advantage of them. And that um, she suggested that I not do that to my readership in the future. I gave her the information which I felt was critical about why that particular decision was made. If, I'm, if I happen to be reading my email that day and I stumble across a message like that that I feel like I can answer, and it's not, you know, just, I think my favorite email, somebody called me a slovenly Miss Lazy Bones. And I didn't, <laughs> wow. I didn't know how to respond to that. So... I just filed it. And so I was like, oh, I don't know how to respond to that. But if I feel like I can respond, then I do. And I explained that um, most of my books are about 110 to 120,000 words. And this book was, in fact, or 100,000 words. So this book was about two and a half times that. So for all three, or this story, these three books were two and a half times that. So therefore, to get the whole story, uh, I was charging two and a half times as much, split across three books. And that sometimes authors need to write stories in different ways to keep their creativity uh, flowing and fresh. And usually my books are standalones within us because I enjoy thinking about stories in different ways. So therefore you have the three books and the three character arcs. And uh, when I explained this to her, she responded back and she said, Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Thanks for responding. Mm. And I also wanted to share it on my Facebook page that her initial email and my email back to her, just in case anybody was having similar thoughts. Because if one person is having those thoughts, then there's a possibility others are as well. And what was interesting to me it was at this point that others started to comment and tell me that this individual was being rude, mm. but I didn't see it that way. Maybe a slightly entitled, maybe slightly entitled, but not really rude because They expressed a concern about a product, and I responded by explaining the rationale of the pricing and the product itself. And to me, it was a very positive exchange. But one thing that social media has also done is if we come, which is unfortunate, and we start to read in, or we, I should say, I see it generally, people start to read into messages or I guess Twitter is now 240 Mm characters-ish or less. So we become very much a a society that is looking at the headline rather than the story. And that's unfortunate. But it was a very positive interaction between the two of us. And I uh, wanted to share it with the rest of my readership. So I don't know if that answers your question or explains what was going on. It does. I found it interesting in a bunch of ways. Like, And you highlighted each of them that that they felt entitled in a way to share that feedback directly with you as a, as a creator, but also the business owner and that you, you shared that exchange in a really honest way. And I think honestly, if you had put up a book that was 240,000 words, you may well have gotten 50 times more people who were annoyed that it was so long. And they're like, Oh, I can't finish this book. Well, you know, that actually happened. I mean, the, the, my longest book prior to this book was 160,000 words and it really should have been split into two different books mm. because it was two separate story arcs. Instead I had part one and part two in the same book. And that particular book suffered. It suffered in reviews and it suffered in sales because my readership Although some people were very happy to read a, you know, a 600 page book, there were a number of individuals who were like, this book was so long, you know, so <laughs> keeping that in mind, and keeping in mind the fact that it was, it is three distinct story arcs, it just makes sense to split it into three and make it a trilogy. So, and that was fun. It's fun to write books and tell stories in different ways and challenge yourself to do that to grow and to learn new and novel ways to tell stories. Otherwise, you have the danger of just becoming very stale. 
Do you think authors should manage reader expectations when they're experimenting with a new way, or even if they should? But like specifically in a genre like romance, where readers have strong expectations of what a book should be, and I'm doing a should be in quotes. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think you even need to put the should be into quotes, because there are groups of reviewers, let's say even on Goodreads, that they have labels that they assign to romance novels. Mm. How's the hero and the heroine uh, been involved with anybody else? Is there cheating? Is there a potential third love interest? Is there, are there all of these things? And if there are any of those things that are slightly objectionable, then they absolutely will not read the book. So should we as authors manage um, reader expectations? I think that if you have built a relationship with your own readership, there's nothing wrong with managing your readership's expectations. That if they're used to receiving um, a particular type of book from you, and if you take a step back or if you take a step to the side, giving them a heads up about that, there's nothing wrong with that's having a relationship with your readership. And that's what any good business owner would do. So, for example, Mumford and Sons, they're, they had these two amazing albums and then their third album nobody enjoys because it was such a departure from what people loved about them to begin with. Mm-hmm. That doesn't mean that their music or that music in general is uh, predictable. That just means that they became popular with a particular brand, particular type of telling their stories through music, and then they took a departure And people were upset about it. And the same thing applies to any art. Romance in particular, I don't think is special in that way. I think if John Grisham were to write a romance novel, his readership (laughs) might have a problem with it. So again, that's managing expectations of your readership. Now, I think the mistake that authors make is when they become more obsessed with the consumers of their art or they become more consumed with people who consume their art than they are with their art themselves, with the art itself. And so again, it goes back to authenticity. If, if you're letting consumers dictate what your ultimate output, your product, your statement, your story to the world is, that's a backwards relationship. It needs to be whatever it is that moves your soul at that particular moment. If you're creating, if you truly think of yourself as an artist that's a line that you shouldn't be crossing. I mean, otherwise you might as well write a choose your own adventure novel, (laughs) which, you know, um, I've thought about doing, I have a, I have a flow diagram and Visio for a choose your own adventure novel that I thought would be fun to write with a number of different authors where you have a Penny Reed heroine and, or you have like an LH Causeway heroine, or you have an Amy Harmon heroine, and then you all start at the same point, and then the story diverges into whatever those particular... I love it. That's that awesome. So cool. <laughs> yeah. I've been trying to get people to subscribe to that, like writing this with me for a while, but they always give me a crazy look when I show them my Vizio flow chart. They're like, okay, right. Okay. <laughs> we'll get back to you on that. Right. Okay, well, we'll be waiting. We're I'm ready. Interested. <laughs> So you've been in the writing game and self-pub business game for quite a while now and and have faced, you know, the typical ups and downs in in one's personal life that that you do in life. I was just kind of curious for you personally, how have you managed to get through harder times in terms of your writing and your publishing for anyone listening who, who might be struggling to kind of keep things going? Well, hmm. So this year in particular has been a challenging one. You know, human interest studies are basically just case studies. Mm -hmm. So in the world of research, you have case studies, which is really just empirical data where you're looking at one particular individual and something that has happened in their medical history or their prognosis or something has happened that is fascinating. And so you're telling the larger medical community about it so that if anybody who's reading the article has had a similar experience with the patient or human subjects, interesting case, Mm -hmm. then typically those medical professionals or those researchers will contact each other and they'll talk about the possibility that this might be more than just a case study. And so I see the value of human interest sharing, meaning Mm -hmm. that this is my experience. If anybody out there who's having a similar experience, this is what you can learn and take away from my experience. I do 
however, have a, I hesitate myself talking about my experiences because they make me feel a little bit like curiosity rather than, mm-hmm. so I hesitate from that perspective, but I will share just so I framed it in, ter- you know, in, in that way. Yeah. So if anybody's listening, you know, please um, don't look at it from a circus sideshow perspective, but more so from a human to human perspective. So my mother died in June of this last year. And then shortly after that, my oldest son was diagnosed with autism. But at the appointment, they also told me that I was also on the spectrum and that I needed to have follow-up appointments to find out where I fall on the autism spectrum. And so when you have these events that occur so close to each other, they become entangled together. They form a a knit. So they create, I I think of things in terms of maybe a yarn, you know, a, a skein of yarn that's you can't untangle, you have to cut it. Or, you know, there there has to be some sort of major change or shift because your creative energy is all being focused. In my case, it was all being focused on trying to process these changes that had occurred uh, in my own understanding of myself. And what has helped me get through it, working through it is obviously seeking professional help is always at the top of that list, that not being ashamed to admit that, um, certain events are overwhelming and therefore you need to take a step back and work with somebody else to help you work through it. So seeking professional help is always at the top of my list for any life-changing event and people are struggling with. But also if going back to you should, for writers in particular, you should be writing because you enjoy the story. You enjoy the process of telling a story not because you need to hit a deadline or because it's your work product. And there's a balance there, obviously. I mean, you need to be responsible and you need to keep your promises and hit deadlines when you've made those promises or whatever. But what I did was I ended up shifting my entire writing schedule forward eight months to give myself some time to process what it, what it occurred. Mm-hmm. And then I wrote this story, The, the Laws of the Physics Trilogy, Because it was a story that I'd been wanting to write for a while, and it was something purely for myself. And that helped me work through any blocks that might have existed. Because I was, since I was writing something completely and purely for myself, something that Marie Kondo would say sparks joy, it sparked joy. (laughs) So, (laughs) sparked joy, then I was writing it for myself. And that was very cathartic and a healing way to approach it rather than this is the book that my readers are expecting. I can't let them down. Well, it's, it's not really about that. If you, if your creative well is completely dry, then you're going to let everybody down. So you have to do whatever it takes to refill it. I'm sorry. That felt like a super long answer. Thanks for sharing it with us. And I think you're right. And so far as everybody you know, it is a bit of a case study. It's a really interesting way of putting it where everyone faces different challenges and deals with them differently, right? But it's comforting to, to hear how you got through it and, um, and that this great work is out there in a way as a result of, of what you went through. Well, yes, that, that was a purely selfish um, story. <laughs> a lot of fun and then the follow-up to that is that I um, have a new series planned that I'm thinking about writing and should probably be coming out in 2021 I've just kind of duct taped it onto my writing schedule it's about <laughs> a woman who finds out that uh, or she discovers that she uh, has been diagnosed as autistic and then her mother dies and then it's all of the, and the first book is called the week before the funeral and it's about all of the absurdity associated with funerals in the United mm-hmm. States because they are so weird. I can't be the only one who feels this way. It's like, all right, your mother died. Now we need to plan a party and talk about <laughs> hors d'oeuvres. It's like, what? Why would I care about hors d'oeuvres, you know? And then it's like, you know, the person was there a week ago. Less than a week ago, the person was there. And then you're in their house going through their things. I mean, yeah. they were just there a week ago. And now we, oh, before the week is over, we need to make sure we get through this room and get it cleaned out. It's like the most bizarre 
no, the whole thing was completely bizarre to me. And as an observer in general, I just started taking all of these notes about all of the ways the experience was completely just crazy. I mean, it just, it's just complete. What we should do is just let people do whatever they want, you know, like, Anyway, but even without having read that book that has not yet been written, I think that would make an awesome movie. Just oh, yeah, thanks. <laughs> I appreciate. It. Well, we'll see how it goes. Okay. Okay. So we have one more question. It's a little different than what we've just asked. I'm sure you probably know, but in, a, in the <laughs> romance community, there's been a couple scandals. We had copy paste <sighs> press, uh, the Ritas. Read is so white, and then we also have cocky gate. But what have been your major takeaways from these controversies? And then did anything surprise you by them? Did you learn something new like I did every day? <laughs> well, I mean, the copy paste, Chris, that was a shocker. That was super surprising that the individual was able to get away with it for as long as they did. So the reason why I was so surprised by copy paste, Chris, was because she was able to get away with it for as long as she did. I think they've just recently passed some requirements for larger retailers. And I guess you would know more about this than I would, that they have larger retailers have two years to comply where they have to check uploaded material for copyright infringement. Is that ringing any bells to you? Uh, yeah, we're certainly aware of the requirement in a way. I mean, with I won't speak to our legal sure, team. Sure. <laughs> however, whatever, however they're dealing with it will come down to us. But we've always been the copyright onus is is on the copyright owner at the begin, you know, at the beginning and end of the day, and then we we have a job to do in between, basically. So right, and so these new uh, regulations that have pop- passed in the European Union, I. I can't see, I mean, I can see that this is maybe the direction things might head moving forward mm-hmm. over here in a couple of years over in this hemisphere. So that'll be interesting to see because this, this was huge. This was just, I mean, I can't believe how many books she was able to mm-hmm. just completely rip off. That yeah. was nuts. So, yeah. And so then thank goodness for readers who made um, everybody aware of it. The Rita So White is is fascinating. It's a fascinating thing. I, I can say it's fascinating because I recognize that um, I have that privilege to say that it's fascinating. But also from a data perspective, a, a data person, it's fascinating. It's been fascinating to watch. So readers are so white. That is hashtag fact. Obviously, <laughs> nobody needed to say that. Um, but <laughs> when I first saw the RWA president's tweets, I immediately went into um, statistician mode, which was, Mm -hmm. oh, well, if that's the case, then let's take a look at the data. Let's see how many of the entrants were. um, Well, okay, so talent is, talent like intelligence would follow a normalized curve within each population subset. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that it doesn't matter what a person's culture is, what a person's skin color is, or their socioeconomic status, talent, the distribution of talent is normalized Mm -hmm. and you have just as much of a likelihood of being an exceptional writer if you grew up wealthy in New York City as if you grew up poor in Arizona. That it doesn't, there's no bias there. Nature has no bias towards talent. So Mm -hmm. the fact that there's not more authors of color who have been nominated means that there is bias someplace. There absolutely is bias. Now, the question that hasn't been answered, and I I only say this because I'm a statistician, and so I I completely understand that racism is a huge problem. And I mean, I can't even, there's not even language to express how big of a problem it is. From a a number cruncher's perspective, there's there's some key information that's missing, meaning is the bias in that the number of submissions from authors of color relative than, to the number of submissions from white authors or since, you know, we so white that they're lower. That's not, I suspect that's not the case. I suspect what's happening is that the judging based, based on the culture of whoever the main characters are, the judging is biased and that the mm-hmm. scores are lower. That's my, my guess is that the scores are lower mm-hmm based on whatever the culture the main characters or the authors um, originate from. And if that's the case, there's actually some 
pretty basic ways that um, ed- education testing does this already. So there's ways to weight the scores to right. get rid of bias. And so if they applied those mathematical models, they could just use the magic of math and science to completely remove bias. And what's cool about it is that it's dynamic. So over, over time, as the bias hopefully is erased, as the scores start to match each other as they should, then the weight would just automatically disappear because the curves would be compared. Well, anyway, I won't get into uh, these scores and all of that, but sorry, now I'm rambling. No, it's um, hurting so much. <laughs> but the thing is that there's ways to just use mathematical models to remove the bias from uh, the scores. And then therefore even the playing field or, for everybody. And I'm hoping that RWA is open to that. There was a blogger slash reader on Twitter who is a PhD candidate in statistics who had reached out to them and offered to help them with any of their questions regarding the data and looking at the statistics behind the data. So I'm hoping that they take her up on that. I think that would be really great. I think her name is Nick. Mm. Anyway, not that anybody cares about that, but so (laughs) we can use the, the power of math and science and tried and true methods to improve where people are imperfect, where um, society shows their ugly side. And then cocky gate. Oh, goodness. So doesn't it feel like years ago now? (laughs) It does feel like years ago now that uh, I reached out. I was so angry. And so I think it was like May 4th. May 4th, I reached out to 60 authors and asked them if they'd be willing to write 5,000 words in three days so that we could put together an anthology and 40 of them responded with a resounding yes. So I guess my takeaway message from cocky gate would be the power of the community that when people band together and take action rather than cocky gate, she sued the anthology, the cocktails anthology. Hmm. And so without her suing, without this individual author suing the cocktails anthology, the trademark was never going, I mean, it was going to take forever for the trademark to be dropped through the system. So to me, the lesson learned there was the power of the community banding together, not going on Twitter and ranting, but banding together, taking action, raising money. And then we ended up raising, the group of us ended up raising, uh, I think it was $33,000 thousand dollars for the bookworm box and one hundred and ten thousand dollars for the rwa advocacy fund and then the rest of the money went to lawyers to fight the lawsuit amazing so the lesson learned there was um rather than complain about something take (laughs) take action to uh fix it for me that was my lesson but i don't know what other people took away from that Well, we're you know in informed spectators and (laughs) you know, taking action on our side as necessary as well. But it's been a tumultuous year, pretty much, I would say. (laughs) It has been. It has been. And it makes me a little sad when we focus so much on, and I'm not saying people need to be nice. I'm not saying be nice. uh, Because nice is very different than being kind. But none of the authors involved in the cocky collective who put together the cocktails anthology spent any of their time, effort, or energy on social media, tearing down this individual who had made these poor choices. And we were, and I feel like what we were able to achieve was a success. Mm -hmm. And so I guess it would be nice as a community. And I think that this is the way that it's going. I'm hoping the romance author community, instead of spending time and energy being angry all the time, but instead looking at practical solutions to help solve the, to actually solve the problem. But that might just be my, um, the statistician in me who's like, okay, well, let's take a step back and figure out how we actually solve this. Yet I don't find a lot of joy. It doesn't spark joy to go <laughs> on, a, on um, let's say Twitter and, and rant about it for several days. But I understand that that makes me unusual. Great answers. It's complex issues. <laughs> <laughs> so last thing, is there anything that you think readers should look forward to in the next, let's say, year that you're really excited about? Yes, I am super excited about the fact that, um, and I can say this because uh, you're Kobo. I am super excited about the fact that I am taking 
my uh, flagship Winston Brothers series completely off of Audible, and I am distributing Ooh. it wide. And so it won't be on Audible anymore. It'll only be available wide and in, book, and in uh, libraries because we are going to be doing a, um, the lead narrator, Chris Brinkley, and I are going to be doing a scripted podcast with also highlights on Nashville, the Nashville music scene short stories and basically it's a scripted podcast where he is the character of Cletus Winston who is the third character or third book in my um, Winston Brothers series and it's called News and Views in Green Valley and it's just kind of like a Prairie Home Companion shenanigans small town podcast and then the last 10 minutes or so he's going to be using to highlight uh, local music in Tennessee, Nashville and then we're also going to be launching Smarty Pants Romance which is a new publishing house of mine that is just for people who write within Pennyverse. And we have 12 books coming out next fall. Three of them are within the, or I should say, nine of them are within the Green Valley world. So the uh, Winston Brothers or the Good Folk series. So that's exciting to see people take my world and write their own unique characters within it and interacting with my established characters. And then three of them are within the Knitting in the City series world up in Chicago. So I have lots of things I'm super excited about, but I'm hoping to use the podcast to do something fun and interesting and novel and bring this whole world more to life and make it feel more real. So we're super excited. Perfect. Thank you so much. We're excited too. And especially on the audio. I can't wait on that. That's super cool. Yeah, I'm excited too. Yay. (laughs) All right. Well, thank you so much for sharing some of your valuable time with us and um, answering all of our questions. I feel like we went all over the map today, but I'm really glad (laughs) that we did. (laughs) Absolutely. Thank you so much. All right. Bye, Penny. So we hope you enjoyed our episode with Penny. As always, make sure to check out the blog for links to everything mentioned in the episode. And if you have any ideas or opinions on what you'd like to see on the podcast next, please reach out to us. I'd love to hear your ideas. You can reach us at writinglife at Kobo.com. And please stay tuned to the end of this episode because Penny has graciously provided an excerpt of her title, Beard Science, for KWL listeners. Thank you so much for listening each week. And here is a sneak peek of Beard Science. Bye, guys. So the unwanting soul sees what's hidden and the ever-wanting soul sees only what it wants. Lao Tzu. Jennifer. On any given day, I woke up and I baked cake. If I had to bake cake, I preferred not to bake in large batches. That's like batch-raising kids, expecting them to think and behave exactly alike, or trying to swim across every lake in East Tennessee at precisely the same time. I preferred to focus on one cake. Each and every cake had its own personality. If you ignored a cake's personality, the cake would ignore you. It'll be a rude, boring cake. I avoided making rude cake. These days, I avoided making cake, period. But if I had to do it, I made great cake. Fun cake. Cake with big dreams. Difficult to ignore. Special cake. Are you finished with the Knoxville order yet? My mama bellowed from the other room. I hadn't heard her come in. Her tone was sharp and edged with panic, and that made me panic. And I swear on your Grandma Lily's fried chicken livers, if you're making one cake at a time again, I'm gonna wring your neck. I squared my shoulders, swallowing the rush of nervous saliva in my mouth. Grandma Lily's fried chicken livers were no joke. Not only were they delicious and a closely guarded family recipe, like most of our infamous family recipes, they could also maim if thrown with enough force and diddly intent. Employing great care, I placed the last of the cakes, the cakes I'd just baked and decorated one at a time, into a bakery box. That's right. I'd baked one cake at a time. Did that mean I had to wake up at zero dark 30 and start baking? Yes, it did. Did I need to admit as much to my mama? No, I did not. Better to wake up at the butt crack of dawn than sell the good people of Barburn boring cakes. Consider the subtleness of the sea, how its most dreaded creatures glide underwater, unapparent for the most part, and treacherously hidden beneath the loveliest tents of azure. Herman Melville, Moby Dick.
Cletus. How can a new transmission be so expensive? I don't got that much money to spend on a new transmission. Despite my best intentions, I was going to have to tell Devron Stokes a falsehood. The transmission is the only part of the bill. We'll give you a deal on the transmission, Mr. Stokes. See here, your muffler needs new bearings, and your tread fluid is running dangerously low. Not to mention the undercarriage spark plugs and crank chortle. Crank chortle was a new one. I just made it up on the spot. Bo was better at this than me, but he wasn't here. The Cretan. Devron sighed, blinking rapidly at the bill on the counter between us. His frown intensified. He shook his head. Well, all right. I mean, I guess the car does need a lot of work. I appreciate the deal on the transmission. I nodded somberly. I was good at somber nodding. It was probably my best, most well-received nod. People always felt comforted when I did it, so I employed it liberally. Mr. Stokes lifted his eyes. You're a good friend, Cletus. I nodded somberly again, but said nothing. Mr. Stokes wasn't my friend. Mr. Stokes wasn't a nice person. He hadn't paid his child support in six years, but always managed to stay well-stocked in whiskey, women, and cigarettes. However, even before I discovered this unsavory fact about Mr. Stokes, I hadn't liked the man. I don't like to judge people. I love it. Writing people completely off was liberating. First impressions were typically correct. My first impressions were always correct. This was because I employed a very scientific approach to forming impressions and was born with infallible logic. I allot ten minutes. If I didn't have ten minutes, I'd put off forming an impression until such a window of time was available. I never deviated from the ten-minute rule. I once put off forming an opinion about our new pastor for six months because I hadn't found the ten minutes required. Thank you for listening to the Kobo Writing Light Podcast, where we provide insights and stories from leaders and experimenters in the world of self-publishing. If you want even more information about growing your Kobo sales, check out our blog or find us on social. And if you're just finding us and ready to start your self-publishing journey today, sign up for free at kobo.com slash writing life. Until next time, happy writing.